genealogical DNA testing. Thank you, Kelly, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the Ann Arbor Library for hosting this event tonight, and especially Kelly, um, Matt, and Josh, who are in the back, and are, who are doing technical support and any other kind of support that we might need this evening. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight as well. So um, my name is Mary Henderson, and we are going to be talking about genetic genealogy which basically genetic genealogy is using a DNA test for family tree purposes, for doing your genealogy research. So, you know, in the old days, we had to do it by looking at census records and wills and birth certificates and death certificates, and we really only had a paper trail to go by. And now we have DNA that can help us confirm or refute um, what we've discovered through our paper trails, if you've um, actually done a, a family tree. So how many people here have actually taken a DNA test yet? Okay, so a lot, a lot of you have. <clears throat> and it's really a hot topic right now. It's, it's um, being advertised very heavily. It's very affordable. A lot of people have done DNA testing already. Um, and then it's also been in the news for um, its role in solving cold cases, cold murder cases. I'm sure you've heard about like the um, Golden State Killer was uh, something that was solved using DNA testing. Um, so, it's a very rapidly evolving field. Um, I, I kind of just covered this. You can, a genetic genealogy is using your DNA test to maybe fill in gaps on your family tree. If there's a line that's missing or if you hit a brick wall, sometimes DNA testing can help with that. It can confirm or refute family lines. Um, if you're adopted or perhaps somebody in your family, a, a parent or a grandparent has been adopted, sometimes DNA testing can help you resolve issues like that as well. So tonight we're going to cover an introduction to genetics. It'll be a little technical, but I'm not a geneticist and you don't have to be a geneticist to be able to understand it. <laughs> But I think you'll get more out of your DNA testing if you understand just a little bit of the basics of genetics and some of the terminology that's used. And then we'll talk about the four different types of DNA tests. We'll also look at the DNA testing companies, Ancestry.com, 23andMe, et cetera. And then we'll talk about what do you do with your DNA results? How do you navigate them? What, what do you glean from your DNA results? Um, OK, so let's launch into genetics. So humans share 99.9% .9 of, of their DNA with one another. Um, and, and that's kind of a shocking, surprising statistic. But the 1% is, is still very significant. because of, Or I'm sorry, the 0.1% is still very significant because the 0.1% is still 3 million differences between your genome and somebody else's. So it's still, I mean, 99.9% .9 seems like, oh, we should all be the same but still a whole huge difference, three million differences, in fact, give or take. Um, and DNA testing is done on a, just on a portion of that, and that should be a 0.1%. I'm sorry, that says 1%, but it should be 0.1%. So DNA testing, like the Ancestry.com or Family Tree um, DNA or whatever, is done on just a portion <laughs> of that 0.1% that is known to differ from person to person. The four types of genealogical DNA tests are autosomal DNA, um, and that's like Ancestry.com is autosomal DNA, and we'll talk at length about this. So, so if you like autosomal what, we'll, we'll cover that. Um, and then there's xDNA testing, yDNA testing, and mitochondrial DNA testing. So I want to talk a little bit about the basic cell structure. Um, and, and I just want to point out that while I'm talking about the cell structure, this would be for a normal human being. There are genetic abnormalities. Um, a normal human being has 23 pairs of chromosomes, but there are um, people who have um, 20, or I'm sorry, 23 pairs, which is 46 chromosomes, and some people have a 47th chromosome. So, and for our conversation tonight, it's going to be about uh, a normal cell structure, a normal chromosomal makeup of a human. Um, okay, so going from large down to small, you have a cell, and within the cell, there's the nucleus of the cell. 
And within the nucleus of the cell are the chromosomes, which are units of DNA and also proteins. Within the chromosomes are genes. Genes are segment of DNA, segments of DNA. Um, and then you have your DNA. And then outside of the nucleus of the cell, you also have the cytoplasm of the cell. And that's where the mitochondrial DNA is held, is in the, in the cytoplasm. So it's not in the nucleus. And if that was all like, huh, we now have a little diagram to look at. So we have the cell, we have the nucleus, which you know, kind of in the center, it's, you know, it's probably not really technically in the center. And then we have our 23 pairs of chromosomes. And again, the chromosomes are um, made up of genes. Genes are segments of DNA. The DNA is made up of nucleotide base pairs, and we'll talk about that. Um, which there are three, three billion. So when we talk about the genome, like when people talk about whole genome sequencing, that's what they're talking about is that three billion base pairs within a cell. And again, the um, testing that we do for genealogical purposes is just on a tiny little portion of that. It's, it's on just a portion of the 0.1% of those three billion, give or take cell, uh, three billion base pairs, give or take, that we have within our cells. <coughs> And if anybody has a question, if, if I'm not being clear or there's something like really confusing, please do let me know. Okay, so here's a, a picture of a chromosome. And you can see how you have your chromosome. And then your chromosome is made up largely of DNA. And the DNA, uh, you can see a segment there that makes up a gene. Um, okay, so DNA, you've probably all heard the term double helix. Well, a helix is nothing more than a spiral. And double helix just means that there are two spirals. So it's kind of like a spiral staircase. Um, you can see, like, you know, here would be, here, here are your two spirals. So that's simply all the, that when people talk about a double helix, that's all it means is two spirals. And then what makes up the ladders, if you will, of, of that staircase, of that DNA staircase, um, are called nucleotides. There are only four nucleotides. That makes it kind of easy to remember. There's adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Um, and this is more than anybody needs to know. But adenine always pairs with thymine. Guanine always pairs with cytosine. And the way I remember that, because I have to have some sort of way to remember technical stuff, your angular letters pair with each other, and the circular letters pair with each other. So the A and the T pair together, and the G and the C pair together. So you've got your angular and your rounded letters that pair, if, if that helps you, helps me. Um, OK, so again, we've got our adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And you'll see them, if you were to look at your raw results, you would just see letters. So it will just be the letter of each one of those nucleotide bases. So there are just four, um, A, A and T pair together, G and C pair together. And um, a genomic difference can be something as simple as just one of those letters being replaced with another letter or one of those pairs, those, um, one of the bases, one of the nucleotide bases being replaced with another one. And so that's called a, um, so in my example here, it would be just maybe thymine being substituted for adenine, or T being substituted for an A. Um, and this is the terminology that you'll come across. If you dive into DNA testing much at all, you'll hear people talk about SNPs. And what SNPs are, um, it's an acronym for single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, so a single nucleotide, you know, it's the ATGC, polymorphisms, more than one form. Um, and a SNP is a location on the genome that's known to vary between individuals. And so that's really what the testing companies are zeroing in on. Um, if I share a variation that somebody else shares, that might be an indication that I'm related to that person. And it's more complicated than that, but that's kind of um, the thrust of what the DNA testing is doing. Um, here is kind of a flattened out picture of what your double helix spiral staircase looks like. 
So this is DNA flattened out. Um, you can see again your, your bases, your A, T, C, and G bases. Um, and then the, the, the um, rails are made up of um, sugar and phosphate, and you know, that's more than we need to know. And then you can see you know, down here what's, con oops, sorry. Um, we can see down here what's considered a, a nucleotide. So you know, if that C um, got replaced in somebody's genome with a T, that would be a SNP or a single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, OK, so we've covered SNPs a little bit. So SNPs and STIRs, those are two um, terms that you'll hear, SNPs and STIRs. Um, and so we talked about the single nucleotide polymorphism, a single nucleotide polymorphism meaning more than one, um, more than one form. Um, and so down at the bottom, I have just another example of what would be a SNP. So here, person one has GTACTGA, and person two has GTACAGA. So that's a single nucleotide polymorphism, or a SNP, or abbreviated SNP. And then another term that you'll hear a lot if you get into the whole um, you know, DNA testing in any um, degree, you'll hear about STIRS. And STIRS are an acronym for short tandem repeats. And what these are is when a pattern of nucleotides repeats over and over. So like GATA, 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 GATA. That's, that would be a short tandem repeat. And um, how it's looked at by the testing companies is somebody might have a repeat of 15 at a particular place, and another person might have a repeat of 16. Um, this comes into play a lot with Y DNA testing. Um, the, the, the short tandem repeats are very key for um, one of the Y DNA tests, and that's what it's looking at is how many repeats does a particular person have versus somebody else? And what do most people have at that spot? And if there are variations, who else matches them in terms of the variations of, the, of how many repeats there are? So you can see you know, here, this would be a repeat of five. Um, so, so that if you hear somebody talk about STRs or STRs, that's what they're referring to is is um, a sequence of nucleotides that repeats over and over. Another terminology that you'll see, and this one you'll see all over, is centimorgans. And it's abbreviated with a small c, big M. Um, and it's actually not a measurement like, like you would think of like a centimeter is a measurement of length. A centimorgan is more a measure of the propensity of um, recombination at a particular spot. And we'll cover recombination, too. Um, and it, centimorgans is actually named after a geneticist with the surname of Morgan. So you know, I thought maybe it had like German origins at first or something. It doesn't. It's just named after um, a geneticist. And it, it's not really important for you to know that it's not measuring length, but you know you can just tuck that away. It's 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 not like you know you measure in, inches or centimeters or whatever. It more has to do with um, the likelihood of recombination for a particular chromosomal segment. Um, the higher the centimorgan shared, the closer mm -hmm. typically the relationship will be between two people. Um, and uh, then also know that at some point um, the Centimorgan shared might become insignificant, where eh, you're not really sure if you are related to the person or not. And genealogists have, you know, varying opinions on what is that minimum threshold. Some say under 10 centimorgans. If, if somebody shares 10 or less centimorgans with you, yeah, you know, maybe it's not really a lead worth following up on. Um, others say, no, it's really seven or under. But you know, just know at some point, if the um, centimorgan shared is, is pretty low, then it might, be, it might be very difficult to figure out who that, how that person <laughs> relates to you, if in fact they do. Or it could even be a false positive. And it could be that, that you may not actually really be related. 
Okay, so let's look at the 23 chromosomes. So this is a pictorial of the 23 chromosomes. Um, they're numbered one, one through 23. Um, and they are numbered um, from largest in size to smallest in size. Although I giggle to myself because on this chart, um, chromosome two does actually look bigger than um, chromosome one, but it's not. So they, they really are numbered um, in or from largest to small. So number one is the largest, and 20, 22 would be the smallest. Um, so the first 22 pairs, so that'd be through to here, the first 22 pairs are called autosomes. So that's what people are talking about when they talk about autosomal DNA. So if you have autosomal DNA testing, that's what it's testing. It's only testing the first 22 pairs of your chromosomes. And then um, the last pair, the 23rd pair, is called the sex chromosomes or the allosomes. And um, that has to do with what gender you are. <coughs> Okay, so we talked about the first 22 pairs, that's autosomal DNA, um, and numbered from largest to smallest. And then the X and the Y DNA, so this is the 23rd pair of chromosomes. Um, well, let me just go back there. I think we'll cover that in, in more detail later, but um, you know, just for now, the first 22 autosomes, the last would have to do with your X or Y DNA testing. Okay, I want to talk just a little bit about recombination. Um, so, if, um, if for each of my pair of chromosomes, I get one from my father and one from my mother, and that is true, we all do, then why don't I have the same DNA as my sibling? And the simple answer to that, the simple and short, without going into too much detail, is recombination, which is something that takes place during the process of meiosis which isn't something that we really need to cover tonight. But um, I just want to explain what recombination itself is. So everybody does, in fact, get one chromosome, one, one of each of the pairs. One comes from the mother, and one comes from the father. But the mother and the father don't pass down their chromosomes intact. So the, the mother and the father both have two of each chromosome. But they don't just pass one or the other intact to, um, to their offspring, to their children. Um, what happens is that the mother's pair of um, chromosomes mixes up a little bit, and same thing with the father. Um, and so that, that's part of the explanation of why siblings don't inherit the same chromosomes from their parents. They each get one chromosome from their father and one from their mother, but it's not going to be the same makeup. Um, and siblings typically would share about 50% of the, of the tested DNA um, with one another. And here's a little pictorial to kind of give you an idea of, of what happens with recombination. So um, again, it's, it's this production of eggs and sperm, that's the meiosis process, which we won't really be going into any detail tonight. Um, and so if this is, say this is your mother, and here are her two chromosome fours, we'll say. What happens is those two chromosomes mix up and, and um, share some segments back and forth between one another so that simplistically, very simplistically, you have something that looks like this. So, it, so it's not one or the other, it's a combination of, of the two that get passed on to the child. So that's recombination. Um, okay, so let's talk about the 23rd chromosomes. So that's the X and the Y. Um, and again, you inherit one from your father and one from your mother. Females have two X chromosomes. And so females can only pass on an X chromosome. They don't have a Y chromosome to pass on. Males have one X chromosome, which is inherited from the mother and they have one Y chromosome, which is inherited from the father. Um, and so you can see, you know, here would be a female with two X chromosomes, here would be a male with an X and a Y. 
And so it is, in fact, the father that determines the gender of the child. Um, the Y chromosome is passed on to sons relatively intact. We talked about recombination. There's actually a teeny tiny little bit of recombination that takes place at the tips of the Y chromosome, but that's all. And then likewise, the um, X chromosome from the father is passed on relatively intact because the father has a Y chromosome and an X chromosome, and the Y and the X are not really doing any recombination. Um, with the mother, though, there is recombination going on with the two X chromosomes. So the mother has two X chromosomes, and there is a little, well, there is <coughs> mixing of the chromosomes. There, there is definitely recombination that takes place with um, the, the X chromosomes being passed on from the mother. Okay, so there, there is Y DNA testing, and this is what it's looking at. So the Y DNA inheritance pattern is that um, if this is a male, so only if this is a male, because if it's a female, the female doesn't have a Y chromosome. We're talking about the Y DNA inheritance pattern here. So um, if this is a male, the male gets its Y chromosome from the father. The father got an X chromosome from the mother. It gets, the father gets a Y chromosome from his father. <coughs> Likewise here, this, this male gets an X chromosome from his mother, a Y from his father. And so the Y um, DNA test is really good for determining the paternal line. It's, it's only going right up that one twig though. So this, for this person, and I'll back up and say, um, typically for a pedigree chart, you have, you have paternal is here and at the top and maternal is at the bottom. So this is all the paternal side of the family. But the Y DNA um, is only going to trace father to father to father. So it won't capture, it won't, won't capture the mother's father. Um, it will only go up this one little twig of the tree. But it's very handy in that way. If, if you really want to know what your paternal line is, it, it can be a very good test to take. Um, and I'm going to touch a little bit on mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondrial DNA, um, this is not in the nucleus. It's in the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, so you can, you know, here's the nucleus, and there's where your um, 23 chromosomes would be. Here's where your um, mitochondrial DNA is. Um, it's normally passed only for, from the mother to the child. I mentioned, though, that you know, just in the past couple months, um, there was a press release about um, some people have inherited from their father. So it's just you know, one of those new information, evolving <coughs> science things. But normally, it's only passed from the mother to the child but it's passed both to female children and to male children. So, um, so both males and females inherit mitochondrial DNA from their mother. Um, it's only useful really for looking at the very ancient lines on the maternal line, and it's not really useful for um, genealogy. It, uh, it doesn't combine, there's a low rate of mutation, and, um, and we'll see later, but um, it's, I, I have done it um, several times for several different people. And it, it's not overly helpful. It, it might be in a rare case, you might be able to use it to solve a genealogical puzzle. But in general, it's not terribly helpful. And so this would be the um, inheritance pattern of the mitochondrial DNA. So it always comes from the mother. Um, at least in a normal situation. And it doesn't matter whether this is a male or a female, they still will have inherited mitochondrial DNA from their mother. Okay, so that covers the genetics section. And I hope everybody isn't like, eyes glassed over. Um, okay, so now, now we're gonna have a test, a quiz. Um, just, just in case we need to like liven up. Okay, so. How many pairs of chromosomes does a new normal human being have? All right, you've been paying attention, or you knew it beforehand. Um, okay, 23 pairs, a normal human being has 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, and what are the first 22 pairs of chromosomes called? Rhizomes? Autosomes, okay. And uh, there you have our answer. 
And what, what is one of the primary reasons that siblings don't share identical DNA? Recombination, all right. Um, okay, which of the children below inherited an X chromosome from their mother? Very good, all of them. Um, and which of the children below inherited a Y chromosome from their father? Bob and Sam, Bob and Sam you all are way ahead on this. Um, okay, and which of the children below inherited mitochondrial DNA from their mother? Perfect. Okay, I have faith that you're all still awake. <laughs> um, okay, so next we are going to talk about the primary four um, DNA testing companies. There are a lot of them out there, um, but these are ones that are you know pretty reputable. These are the, the bigger testing companies. So we have Ancestry.com, we have Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, and 23andMe. Um, and I want to talk just a little bit. Of, this will um, apply to all of the different testing companies, but looking at your DNA test results. Um, so just as a general guideline, um, so whoever you tested it with, whichever company it was, what do you do? Okay, so like my test came in, so, so what do I do? Okay, the first thing everybody wants to do, myself included, is look at um, heritage or admixture ethnicity. You know, everybody wants to know, you know, am I really like through and through German or whatever? Um, and we'll talk about that. But then um, f that, that won't really necessarily come into play so much when you're actually working on your genealogy. Sometimes your ethnicity does. In certain cases, a lot of times it won't. And you know, a lot of times people are going to kind of have the same heritage you do. We're all, you know, here we are in the US of A, and we tend to have a, a mix of ethnicities. There are some times when it, it can give some clues in terms of um, tracing your family tree or filling in gaps on your family tree, but in general, it's just fun. Um, but what you do want to do, no matter which company you test it with, is you want to look at your DNA matches and then see, you know, start looking at them and see how closely are they related to you, et cetera. Um, and then you also want to be looking at um, your, um, um, thinking about who the shared matches are with your DNA matches and also adding in your family tree. So here are the specific steps, though, that, that I want to talk about. Um, so when you get your results, one thing that you might want to do is you might want to add your family tree to your profile. And each company has a slightly different platform for doing that. Um, we'll talk about this in further detail. But on Ancestry.com, if you link your DNA kit to a family tree, you'll get these green leaf hints, which say, so-and-so is not only a DNA match to you, but there's also somebody in their family tree that matches your family tree. So that can be very helpful. Um, so that's one thing that you might want to do when you first get your results. And it sounds like a lot of you already have your results. So if you haven't, you might want to add your um, family tree. And then, then you want to look at your DNA matches. So again, you navigate to it in different ways, depending upon the testing company. But, but that's the thing you want to do is, okay, who are my DNA matches? And then start with your closest match is, but you know, I'd start right up at the very top and um, look to see if it's somebody you know. Oh, here's, here's Aunt Josephine, look at that. She's my closest um, DNA match. And then look to make sure that Aunt Josephine appears to, to share that expected relationship with you, that Aunt Josephine does appear to be with the um, aunt, niece, aunt, nephew relationship, because that can be a clue there too. And then go through your matches, maybe starting at the top, and, the, and then pretty soon you'll probably come to a match that you don't know how they relate. And so what you want to do there is, if they have a family tree, look at their family tree and see if, they're, if you can spot a common ancestor. If they don't have a family tree, you can contact them and ask them if they would share their family tree with you. And then the other clue that you can get is you look at the match for whom you're not sure what the relationship is and look at the shared matches for that match 
And that might give you a clue as well. So if you look at the shared matches, um, you can maybe, you could maybe you see that, oh, I don't know who this match is, but look, they match Aunt Josephine, so they must be on that side of the, the family. Or, oh, um, here are the shared matches and I don't recognize any of them. Then you can look at the um, trees of those shared matches. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Um, ethnicity estimates, I, I want to talk about that. Okay, so this is somebody that has tested at all four companies. It's one person, and you can see how dramatically different the results are. So like East Europe, Family Tree DNA says it's 34%. Um, Ancestry says it's 2%. And, and I, I realize that part of it can be, okay, what, what are they considering to be East Europe? So that can account for part of it, certainly. But, you know, it's just like, eh, take it with a little grain of salt because, you know, it's not really cut and dry. And so here on the screen I have um, down at the bottom just a chart that shows. So like um, the skin is the same one person. Um, East Europe, 34%, Family Tree DNA, 2%, Ancestry.com. Uh, British Isles ranges, you know, 62% at Family Tree DNA to um, 30, 35%, whoops, 35% over here for 23andMe. And just to further illustrate this, um, how it's an evolving field. So this is just Ancestry, and I think Ancestry within, say, the last three, four months has gone through two of these revisions, mm -hmm. but this is just the latest revision. So this is one person, one person's test, um, and if you've tested with Ancestry and you've gone in recently, you'll see this like, oh, you know, your, your DNA data is still the same, which of course it is, um, but we've tweaked our um, ethnicity estimates. And so, um, before the revision, same, same person, oops, I'm sorry, um, we, the, it was estimated 4% Great Britain. Now it's um, 50, what is that, 56%. So there's a 52% change. And, it, and it's, not like, it's not like, oh, we just added Great Britain as a new category. I mean, you can see, here's Great Britain, there's Great Britain. So, you know, that's where I feel like you just have to take it with a grain of salt. And it's a very inexact science determining ethnicities because you know, people moved around and even, you know, 600 years ago. People moved around, so so you know it's fun. I think it's fun, but you know you just have to be a little cautious with it. Okay, so we're going to talk about Ancestry.com. So um, here's I'm just going to show you. Here's how you would get to your ethnicity estimates, and this should be in your handouts too. So if you go home and you're like, oh, I forgot how to do that, and then we just looked at this, so that's um, that's it. Okay, so here's where you look at your DNA matches. So here's where you're really getting into the meat of doing something that would be useful for your family tree. And it's chock full of information. Uh, I think the next one. So, oh, and by the way, um, Ancestry has tweaked what shows up on the first page versus what you see on the shared matches. It's essentially the same, but um, oh, it, this last logged in is now on the matches page. And what they brought forward from the matches page is how many centimorgans of DNA you share. So they must have thought that that was, you know, people wanted to see that more prominently than they wanted to see when the person last logged in, which can actually be very important too. Okay, so um, we have the estimated relationship. We have the confidence that of, of that relationship. Um, last logged in, which again shows up on a different page now. Um, and then um, over here you can see, uh, do they have a family tree? This person has a family tree. There are 33 people on their family tree. Uh, here's a green leaf hint, so that means that not only is that person a DNA match, but they also have somebody in their family tree that matches my family tree. Um, here's somebody that has an unlinked tree, so it means you, kind of, you have to navigate through to see, you can still see a tree, but it hasn't been linked to their DNA kit. Um, here is somebody who has made their tree private. So that's always a frustration, but you know, what can you do? You can contact them, or sometimes build it based off of um, you know their, what you can glean from their profile. Um, and this little thing here indicates that little right there means is it a match to another kit that you manage? So um, so here it shows you how you descend from that person and how your match descends from that person. Uh, here you get your ethnicity of the match, 
your relationship. Um, so, you know, that's chock full of information. This is a green leaf hint that I was referring to, where they're a DNA match and there's a shared ancestor in your family trees. And then you can also look at the shared matches of, of this match. So that's what I was um, mentioning before. If you don't know how they relate, you might want to look at the shared matches. And then here's what the, the shared matches um, show. Remember that a shared match, though, does not necessarily mean, so if you have a DNA match, and now you look at the shared matches, it doesn't necessarily mean that those shared matches all share a common ancestor. With Ancestry.com, in general, it's pretty good about that. They phase their matches, which isn't something that we've talked about, but um, in general, they, um, Ancestry, you can f pretty well rely on it. Um, I'm just going to take you through some screenshots of how to add your family trees. So, you know, on, the, on your home page, you would click on the trees, and then um, you can either put your tree in manually, or you can upload if you have a file. It's called a JEDCOM file. So if you have family tree software on your computer, you can upload a JEDCOM file to get your family tree into Ancestry.com. Um, and then more on just linking. You have to link the tree to your kit in order to get those green leaf hints. Um, now, when you're building your family tree on Ancestry.com, you will also get green leaf hints for building your tree. So these are different from the green leaf hints that you get for your DNA matches. You also get hints when you're building your tree. And so like, for this person, they're saying, oh, um, Ancestry is saying, hey, you know, I think we have some records on that person. And it might be census records or birth, death, marriage records or whatever. Um, or they will even tell you, hey, we think we know who the father, you don't have a father in there, but we think we know who the father is there. Now, bearing in mind that a lot of this is um, based off of family trees that other people have built, which may or may not be accurate. Sometimes I do a quick and a dirty tree. if, if you know, I have a particular goal, but if it's something I'm really relying on, I would do the um, research myself and I wouldn't just rely on a tree that somebody else had put together. There, there are a lot of um, discrepancies. And I'll talk about pros and cons of the different um, companies, but with Ancestry, one of the big um, drawbacks, it's a, it's a very good site. In fact, I would have to say it's, it's my preferred site for working in. But it's expensive because you have to, to really get the value of it, you have to have a subscription. And, and the subscriptions are not inexpensive. So um, that, that to me is one of the big downsides. If it weren't for that, they'd almost be perfect. But. Okay, so now we are going to talk about family tree DNA. Um, okay, so ethnicity, well, you know, that, this is how you navigate to your ethnicity. We talked about that. And then here, here it is again. Here's what you see when you um, click on the My Origins page. So first we'll talk about Family Tree DNA's Family Finder test, which is an autosomal test. Um, and let me just also say that Ancestry.com is also an autosomal test. So remember, that's your first 22 chromosomes. <coughs> it doesn't include the X and the Y. Um, Okay, so first you want to look at, you've looked at your ethnicity and, you know, been titillated by that. Okay, now you um, would want to look, for genealogical purposes, you want to look at your matches. And so this is how you navigate there. And then this is the information that you get on um, this page. So, um, so this tells you whether or not the person has a tree, first person, the top person does, this person has a tree. This does not. It's grayed out. This is where you can take notes on that person. You can put notes of your own in. Um, this is their email um, contact information, and it gives a little profile. And then this um, is where they tr Family Tree DNA tries to take an estimate of whether this is going to be on your paternal or maternal side. Um, one of the positives about Family Tree DNA is that you do get an email address if they disclose it, but the default is to disclose it. And on Ancestry.com, you don't get that. So um, you have to go through their messaging, their own little messaging process for Ancestry.com. And one of the reasons, well, you know, so if somebody's not logging into their Ancestry.com um, website, then they're probably not going to see your message, although you can, set it, you can set it up so that you 
get notification when you get a new message, but you know, what if they haven't chosen that option? And the other is that you can often glean information about a person by Googling their email. So, uh, you know, I really wish Ancestry did have um, email addresses as part of the profile, but they don't. Family Tree DNA does, unless somebody opts out, and I think that's very rare. Um, Family Tree DNA does have a chromosome browser so that you can actually see, um, you, can, you can, you know, say, oh, I want only, only want to see my X matches or whatever. And you can actually see, uh, you can also download all matches. And I'll show you what the download all matches looks like. So this is where you have your, this is you, these are your matches, and it tells you chromosome one, you match this person starting at this location and ending at that location, and that's you know 1.22 centimorgans. Um, okay, now we're gonna talk about the Y DNA testing. So um, Family Tree DNA does provide Y DNA testing, Ancestry.com does not. Um, there are going to be two types of Y DNA testing. There's the STR, the short tandem repeats that we talked about, um, and then the SNP testing. Um, oops. This is the STR testing, short tandem repeats. This is the SNP testing. This is the big Y. The big Y goes back, it's your ancient origins of your paternal line, and it's not particularly useful for genealogy. There, there are people that are really into it, but in, if you, you know, are trying to trace um, your family tree, for those purposes, um, this big Y test is not particularly helpful. It's, it's interesting. It's kind of like the ethnicity to me, anyhow. It's interesting, but it's not really going to get me very far with my family tree. But this actually can. Okay, so this is where um, you have these different levels of markers. You can test at the Y12 level, which means they will test 12 markers. You can test at the Y25, Y37, and Y67, Y111. Um, Although um, there's now some additional step or STR testing that's going on in here. But skipping over that, just, just concentrating on this. So, um, this is where you really can get some good clues about the paternal line. Um, okay, so, but not always. So it, it uh, and, and even in, in my case, you know, I don't have, there's not anything particularly unusual about my heritage, and it's not a particularly endogamous tree, but nonetheless, okay, so, um, so one thing I just want to talk about here, so your hope would be, so these are your Y-DNA matches, and your hope would be that these, these matches would match your surname, but they don't always. You know, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, and I'm going to show you three examples of this. One came out beautifully and the other two, not so much. So um, this person tested at the Y111 level, but they don't have any matches at that level. Their closest matches are at 67. And Family Tree DNA will just kind of screen you through to the level where you do have matches. Um, and then, so here I have a match with the last name of Livingston that is not the last name of the person that did the Y DNA test. <laughs> so there was a little puzzle. Um, and because look, there's another Livingston. And then the one thing that you, and this might address the question that we had earlier about how far back it goes, and it might just help with the Y DNA testing in general, but. Genetic distance does not mean generational distance. Um, and, and they should probably really call it something different. What, it, what that really is, is that it, of the 67 markers, this person does not match on one of those markers. That's what it means. But, um, so I'm going to show you. So um, down here, there, there's a TIP report, T-I-P. There's a little orange icon. And here's, the, here, here's a bigger <laughs> screenshot of it. So for this person who has a genetic distance of one, see, I really think they should call it a uh, STR variation, because genetic distance to me is, is confusing. You're like, oh, just one generation away. It must, must be my uncle. Um, but you can see here, if you click on that, it'll tell you. So there's a 90% chance that within four generations, you'll have a match. Um, and we talked about, you know, you would hope that matches your last name, and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, now here's an, another person. And they, too, tested at 111 markers. 
they only have matches at 37. Brown, brown, brown. Brown is not the surname that tested. Um, and even at 37 markers, so you don't have anybody at 111, you don't have anybody at the 67, um, and even at that, it's a genetic distance of four. In a genetic distance of four, there is only a 32% chance that you will match within four generations. 72% um, chance, eight. But you can see you know, how far this goes back. So it does go back. I mean, theoretically, if the, if the surname were brown, uh, you, know, you could m match with somebody who has a surname brown, and your matched ancestor could be back in the you know, 1500s or whatever. So it does go back very far. Um, OK, so here, here is the third test that I have as an example. And this actually was a successful test for me. Um, the person tested at 111 markers, and they have matches at 111 markers. Um, the surname is Kilman, and here's a Kilman match. And in fact, I know who William Ross Kilman is, and it is a common ancestor, and it does go back to the 1600s. So for me, this, this was a success, successful test. I suspect that McFarland is a Kilman, but that's another story. <laughs> um, so hopefully that tells you a little bit about how to navigate the, um, the STR tests, the Y DNA tests, for um, genealogical purposes. And, and when you have a lot of surnames and they just aren't matching up, you know, do, do click on the tip to see if they're within um, a range that you think might be findable um, within a generation, you know, range that would be findable or not. And then otherwise you just have to compare family trees and it's, it's, it can be very difficult. But for some people, like, you know, for this person, it was all, all beautiful. The previous two, yeah, not so much. Um, and this was just another example of, of why I do think that McFarland is, you can see the, the Kilman match, a much lower percent of being within four generations and then McFarland. That's why I do suspect that the McFarland is actually a Kilman. Um, but just a little side anecdote. So the McFarland in this case is very vested in being a McFarland, like head of, head of the Virginia clan McFarland, whatever. So, um, so I don't think they were very receptive to thinking that they're anything but that. So um, mitochondrial DNA, we're just not really going to spend any time on it, and I'll show you why. So um, mtDNA, that stands for mitochondrial DNA, and here, a genetic distance of zero means you have a 95% chance that there's a match in the last 22 generations. So, so never mind. Um, OK, 23andMe, this is how you would um, navigate to your ancestry, the ethnicity that we have talked about. Um, they have something kind of cool. It's, but you know, again, take it with a grain of salt, because it's all evolving in terms of ethnicity. But um, so this, this is a chromosome map um, purportedly of your ethnicity, like where on all your chromosomes your, your you know, Finnish heritage comes in. And you can actually hover over though. So like I, in this screenshot, I hovered over Eastern, Euro Eastern European heritage and you know, it claims it's on those chromosomes. So you know, for whatever it's worth. <laughs> um, OK, so 23, um, 23 and me is what we're discussing now. And here's how you would navigate to actually see your, um, your matches, to see if you recognize them or if you don't, if you can figure out how, how you are related to them. And these screenshots should all be in your handouts. So you know I'm kind of going through it quickly, but um, you should be able to you know, see the same shots. You know, if you go home, you're like, oh, I can't remember how we did that. Um, 23andMe, here's where it shares, shows whether the person is sharing. This gets to the privacy questions that we've had. Um, uh, so like, you can see four of the eight matches are not sharing. And that's one of the things with 23andMe. It's, it's, in my mind, one of the downsides. A lot of people did 23andMe testing because they were interested in the health reports. 23andMe, um, if you pay the money, provides you with, with health reports. And so some people have done 23andMe testing, and they have no interest in, um, in genealogy. So, um, and you could kind of get this here where, um, you know, we, we have four of the eight that, that are not sharing their ancestry information. It doesn't mean you can't contact them, and they might not um, share it with you, but um, 
it's a slight downside, I think, to 23andMe. Um, you can click on a match to um, get a comparison. You can see, okay, these are, for that match that I clicked on, these are the chromosomal segments that I overlap with that person on. Um, and then when I look at the shared relatives, so, so I clicked on Jane, and um, here are um, relatives in common. 23andMe does do um, a cool thing in that they do um, do a triangulation of sorts. So, um, so like here, here's a shared relative. So I've cl clicked on the shared matches with Jane. Karen's a shared match, but there isn't shared DNA. So it means you know, Karen has some sort of a DNA tie with Jane. Karen also has a DNA tie with me. But, Karen, um, but all three of us don't share the same common ancestor. That could be a confusing thing to think about. Sometimes I have to wrap my head around it. Um, and then you can click to see what the overlapping segments are. So here, here is um, Betty. This is actually the test for Betty. So here's Betty and Jane. Here's Betty and Nancy. And you can see here's where the three of them do appear to overlap. And so that probably is what is called a triangulated segment that likely indicates that they do share a common ancestor. Um, and then we talked about no means that there they're likely is not a common ancestor. Um, this is more, just more on the chromosomal overlaps. Um, so 23andMe does a lot of, of letting you compare people in the um, chromosome browser. And here's another example of um, looking at five other people to see, okay, are there some shared overlaps? And like, I really don't see any good ones that are all five, but you know there's a potential one that um, possibly might indicate a common ancestor in your family trees. Um, lastly, we'll talk about my heritage, ethnicity. Um, you would go up to DNA and then the ethnicity estimates. And here's the screen that you would see for your ethnicity. Um, and then to look at your DNA matches, um, here's how you would navigate to that. Um, okay, so here we see, here's, here's a match. Tells you the estimated relationship. Um, gives it both in percentages and, a, um, and centimorgans of the, what the shared DNA is. And then you can look at the, again, the shared um, you can look at shared matches with, with this match, so shared matches, and it will also give you some other information as well. So here are the, here are the shared matches. Um, this over here indicates that there's a triangulated segment. So that should mean that this, this was, um, this is Betty's test, this is Betty and somebody with the initials of BNS, um, and it indicates that somebody with the initials BK does share one triangulated segment. So BK, BS, and Betty, who this test is for, do share a triangulated segment, so they should have a common ancestor in their family tree. If we click on that, this is the screen that you'll see. So they'll show you exactly what chromosome the overlapping segment is and um, how many centimorgans shared. Um, and then there, so, so this is actually not a triangulated segment. This was the only one that my heritage um, marked as a triangulated segment. So that just, in, and because I know these kits, I know one is actually on the paternal side and one's on the maternal side. I mean, this would look like, oh, wow, that's quite a match. But uh, for the three kits, it really is not. Um, and so that's where um, we get into triangulations for, <laughs> To sh it's not enough just to have a shared match with another match. Um, in order to be triangulated and to feel fairly assured that you and two other people, two or more other people, share a common ancestor, you need to have um, an overlapping chromosomal segment, and it, it has to be the same overlapping chromosomal segment, like chromosome four from this spot to that spot. Roughly, you know, there can be variations, but it would have to be same chromosome, same rough spot. Um, and 
each person in that group must be related to another person in the group. So like you could have a match on that's on your paternal side, you could have another match on your maternal side, and those two might match each other on a totally different line. Um, so that's where triangulations come in. Comparison of the testing companies, and this is really just my opinion, um, but um, <coughs> what I've put together here is a chart for, for one <coughs> particular kit, but this carries over to other kits because I've tracked this for other kits. Ancestry.com, far and away, you know, here's the top match. The top match for this kit was some um, 406 centimorgans. Um, and I actually excluded a close family member for that test. So I didn't, I mean, this would have been even higher. But, you know, there were, I knew there was a close family member that tested on Ancestry. So, um, and I excluded kits that were administered by me. So close family members. This one I did not administer, but I excluded it anyway. But you can see, I mean, the top match in Ancestry is, is quite a bit larger than on the others. Um, and matches that were over 100 centimorgans, we've got 29 on Ancestry and quite a bit lower on the other testing sites. Um, and then matches between 50 and 100 centimorgans, 69, which is um, much higher than my heritage in 23 and me, but um, family tree DNA actually did have a lot more that were between this range. So Ancestry d does just have the bigger database. Um, they, they phase their matches, so they make an, an attempt with their algorithms to figure out which of your matches match you on your paternal side versus which match you on your maternal side. So they're a little bit more triangulated. Not perfect, but they, they do a pretty good job. But um, so if the tests are on sale, they're all about the same price, you know, give or take. They're, they're all pretty much, you know, depending, you know, Christmas time, there are sales, Father's Day, there are sales, you know, there's sales for pretty much every, you know, President's Day, there's probably going to be a sale. Um, but the, the downside is that Ancestry.com does charge a, um, a membership, a subscription fee for you to be able to use the resources that really make it worthwhile. Um, and my heritage also does um, have a fee for the full features, but they pretty good features actually without paying that. So the cost is, is pretty similar, except again for the subscriptions. Here's um, a thought for how you can leverage your DNA testing. You can test with Ancestry.com and be aware of the subscription fees. And then you can upload for free to FamilyTreeDNA.com and also MyHeritage.com. You can upload for free. You'll get limited tools um, for your kits then on FamilyTreeDNA and My Her MyHeritage, but you will be able to see your matches. Um, and then you can also, for any of, the, any of the four testing companies that we've talked about, you can upload to GEDmatch. And so I'm just going to show you, oh, I, w I wanted to run through the pros and cons, which I kind of really pretty much have. Um, so Ancestry has the largest da database. Um, one nice thing is you can have multiple kits under one login. Family Tree DNA, um, you have to have a different login for each kit that you manage. And Family Tree DNA kicks you out if you're not active after a while. I mean, Ancestry just leaves you in forever. Um, Family Tree DNA kicks you out, and then you have to you know, go look up your password and, and so forth. Um, Good tools for building family trees at Ancestry. Good tools for research if you pay their annual fee. Um, the, the downsides, annual fee, they don't give you chromosomal information, detailed chromosomal information, and you don't get an email address, which is sometimes very hel helpful to try to figure out um, who, who somebody is if you don't have much information on a match. Family tree DNA, um, no annual fees. You do get email addresses. They have a chromosome browser. Um, I find some of their platforms a little clunky. Um, you can't share your DNA results with somebody else. You have to actually give them your login information. On Ancestry, there's a way to just share. I can let somebody look at my DNA matches. I don't have to give them access to my account. Um, and I talked about you can only have one kit per login, and it logs you out if you're not active after a certain amount of time. Um, 23andMe, chromosome browser, um, and I'm sorry, so the mitochondrial DNA and the Y DNA haplogroup is in included in this test. So I said earlier that Family Tree um, DNA is the only one that does Y testing, but um, 23andMe at least will give you a Y DNA haplogroup 
as part of your test. 23andMe failed tests. I took the test twice. Both times they told me that I didn't have sufficient DNA in my saliva. Um, so, and then I kind of got a weird little note saying, and you know, we'll refund your money after shipping and handling. If you agree, you'll never send us a test again. I was like, okay. So, um, and then subsequently, people in the um, genealogy community said, you know, there are ways that I could have improved that. Like, I always drink hot tea in the morning. And even though you're not supposed to eat or drink an hour before, and I didn't, if, if you don't have anything hot, you know, maybe even more than an hour before, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I kind of have a bias against them. Um, you get a lot of non-sharing matches, fewer family trees, and, and non-responsive matches because they are primarily in it for the um, testing. And then my heritage, I mentioned that you can transfer your files for free. They, like Ancestry, they phase data. They try to determine whether it's paternal or maternal. They do have that triangulation feature that we looked at and is in your screenshots. Um, they also have a somewhat clunky interface. There's only 10 matches per page. Ancestry has 50 matches per page. Um, my heritage only 10. It seems like a petty little thing, but sometimes it's annoying. Okay, I just want to touch on GEDmatch. We're just about to finish up here. Um, and GEDmatch is, this is, you know, co constantly changing, constantly new tools, but GEDmatch is migrating to a, a new site, um, but I just want to talk out about it a little bit. This is a site, it's a free site, no matter where you test it, pretty much, you can upload your results to GEDmatch, and then you can, so like if I only test it with Ancestry.com, I could upload my results, and I could compare it to people who had tested at 23andMe or MyHeritage if they have also uploaded. Um, so that's the advantage of um, GEDmatch. And I just kind of take you through some screenshots, which are in your handouts, that um, these, these are the tools I use the most, the one-to-many or the one-to-one. -one. So this tells you all your matches. So that would be kind of like your shared matches in the other um, sites. This would let you compare one-to-one. -one. If you just want, have one person, you want to see exactly where your chromosomal overlaps are. Um, you can see who, people who match um, one or both of two kits. And, and this is always fun. Are your parents related? <laughs> Um, this just takes you through the, more often than you think, um, this just helps you walk through how you would upload your results to um, GEDmatch. And then here's a handy thing, you can look up a person by email to see if they are on or, or if they are in GEDmatch. So that's where emails are super handy. Um, that's just one of the ways you can use an email. So I just want to close by saying, again, it's a rapidly evolving field. We const there are constantly new analytical tools that are coming out. There, um, you know, like I said, ethnicity estimates are constantly being tweaked. Um, whole genome testing might become more standard in the future. And that concludes tonight's presentation. Um, thank you for coming, and I hope you found something interesting from the presentation. This program was recorded on January 7th, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.